changes they've been yearning for, freedom, democracy and an improved economy. Join me, Ben Brown, for live coverage from here in Harare on BBC World News. Global business news from the boardroom or grassroots. Aaron Hesselhurst cuts through the jargon with live reaction from Wall Street and Asia, studio interviews with top CEOs and the latest innovations in technology. Talking business on BBC World News. Hello there. We are live across the globe and it's time for the money news that matters. I'm Rachel Horn and this is talking business. Let's take a look at the headlines. Our top story, more misery for Japanese manufacturing. Mitsubishi is best known for its cars, but another division admits to being the latest to fake quality control data. This time it's on parts for planes and cars. We're going to be hearing from one expert who says Japan may have set the standard for modern manufacturing, but those standards are no longer up to scratch. Uber's hacking crisis takes another turn as the British government says it lacks confidence in the company numbers and more investigations are open. We've also got the latest from the global markets and the inflated cost of balloons. This is the scene live in New York as the Thanksgiving Day Parade gets underway. We can't quite see it, we'll bring it to you soon. But the inflatables that you'll see, are they really worth what they cost? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. We'll be talking about that all to come on this edition of Talking Business. Good morning America, evening Asia, hello world. Another Japanese company is apologizing for faking safety data. Mitsubishi Materials, which is part of the conglomerate best known around the world for its cars, altered the specs of rubber seals and copper products to meet customer demands. Different subsidiaries sold them to 258 companies for uses including cars, aircraft and the electric power industry. Now in the period in question, the Mitsubishi subsidiaries involved sold $1.35 billion worth of those products. So far, no safety issues have been reported. Now, this comes after other recent Japanese safety scandals involving Kobe Steel, Nissan and Subaru have all increased pressure on Japanese manufacturing to get things right. Well, let's get rid of the cube now. And this whole idea of made in Japan, that label which was once a sign of real quality, it's taken a bit of a hammering. Now, Professor Richard Werner is an expert on Japanese industry at the University of Southampton in the south of England. Professor Werner, thank you very much for joining us on Thank the show you. now as i said there that that label made in japan was once a sign of real quality is that still the case or how damaging have all these stories been for the industry we've had quite a few stories in the in the past uh, several years uh, some major names um, have been affected by various scandals so it's it's bad news to have another name it's perhaps a bit unfortunate from uh, the viewpoint of uh, the mitsubishi group of companies because you know it's not really one conglomerate it is companies that are connected indirectly very indirectly through shareholdings um, and of course Mitsubishi materials is not a very known company and it was three of their subsidiaries but the reality is that you know people hear the name Mitsubishi and they will start to wonder is this another um, you know, tarnishing of the, this great reputation that Japan has built in the post-war era through hard work, attention to detail, meticulous engineering, top quality products. Is this uh, really, is this perhaps changing? Of course, on the bigger picture, Japan has been in a big recession for, for over 20 years. There's no recovery going on, but that also raised doubts about, you know, Japanese style um, economic management um, are all these things perhaps not working so these doubts um, you know there's this the the seeds of doubts have been sown if you want and uh, um, they could have a negative impact because when you purchase a product um, whatever it is you just don't know at that moment whether it's going to break down in 10 minutes or not and so you are as a manufacturer always dependent on trust and the credibility you've built so it's your reputation that matters which is why this is an important issue the reputation is really what um, 
industry lives on. So German exports, based on you know the success, is very much built on uh, the reputation built over centuries, and the same for for Japanese manufacturing. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, about exports. Just how crucial are exports to the Japanese economy, and, and do you think we're going to see an impact uh, because of these stories? Um, well, overall, there has been a bit of a change. So the imports have become more important in Japan, and the domestic economy, particularly in the last uh, few years, has become uh, more important. But it's still true that uh, it is one of the world's most successful exporters. Um, and the export industries, even though exports themselves as a number are not that large as a percentage of GDP, but there is a whole chain, you know, a supply chain of subcontractors and so on, and a lot of jobs are dependent on exports. Therefore, of course, it is important. I don't think this particular instance is going to change very much, but it's just, you know, there's another sort of needle and another needle, and perhaps, you know, soon we'll hear more. Um, therefore, a lot of people may start to wonder. However, I would say, let's look at the bright side. <laughs> the bright side is that a, um, a, a group company, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Materials, found problems in three of its fairly unknown subsidiaries and went public fairly quickly once they found out. So that's actually good news. And you could actually argue, perhaps a few years ago, they would have tried to cover this up for years, and we would have heard about it much later. And so I would look at the bright side, and perhaps you know things are changing. They are tidying up the act. Because of course, frankly, you know, incidents like that we have all over the world. And I think people are a bit more sensitive now to Japanese news like this. So this gets picked up more. But perhaps the positive uh, side is, you know, this you know, little known company, Mitsubishi Materials, decided to go public with this uh, in a fairly big way and therefore is trying to clean up its act. So that's okay. good news. Professor Richard Werner, the University of Southampton in the south of England, thank you for your time. Now from one industry with a tarnished image to a company with a tarnished image. The problems keep piling up for the ride-hailing app Uber. On Tuesday they revealed the details of 57 million customers and drivers had been accessed by hackers. And in just the last few hours the UK government has said it does not have sufficient confidence in the number of Britons Uber told them have been affected. Now it comes as more regulators open investigations. Well joining me is our economics correspondent Andrew Walker. Andrew, what else was said in House of Commons today? Well, it was quite a striking exchange. Um, as you, you mentioned, what the minister, Matt Hancock, said when he was asked about the, um, about the number of, of British passengers had been affected and they simply don't have the confidence to give a number. They do propose to come back to the, uh, to the House of Commons with an initial assessment once the, some further work has been done by the, by the UK authorities. But um, amongst uh, some of the comments from... Um, other members of the, of the House of Commons, one described the company as grubby and unethical, claiming that Uber plays fast and loose with the personal data of its 57 million customers and drivers. Another described the business as unethical. Um, I mean, I should say that, um, that the, uh, the company's chief executive, Dara Khosrowshahi, has said that um, while they've seen no evidence of fraud or misuse tied to the incidents, they are monitoring all the affected accounts um, and they've promised that, um, that they will learn from their mistakes. Now, we have to say, Uber is not the only company who's been victims of, of mm -hmm. a cyber hack like this. Absolutely. The issue here is how Uber dealt with it. They, Indeed, they, they yeah, tried yeah. to pay the hackers off, they, they yeah. tried to cover and, it up. And in contrast with, um, with Mitsubishi, where Professor Warner was saying they, 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 cut, they, they confessed very quickly, this was more than a year before before Uber told us what was going on. And now we have new rules coming into play, Indeed. don't we, in, in Europe specifically from Indeed. next year, which would mean the companies could be really, really from, heavily fined for covering these up. From May next year, new regulations in the European Union mean that companies will, under normal circumstances, have 72 hours to tell the local national regulator about a breach. I and mean, if there's a good reason, they may be able to to delay it beyond that, but they'll have to explain themselves. Um, and for breaching that duty to notify the local regulator, um, there's a potential fine of up to 4% of global turnover. Yes, so yes, so it's, not it's even global serious profit, sanctions. It's turnover. Indeed, so a company that hasn't yet got to the stage of making a profit, as many tech companies um, have not, um, then that means that the fact that they're losing money doesn't mean they'll get away with it.
Okay, Andrew Walker, economics correspondent, thank you very much. Okay, let's take a look at what other uh, stories are making the headlines in the business world today. And the Finnish company behind the hit smartphone game, Angry Birds, has disappointed investors with its first results since its shares listed on the Helsinki Stock Exchange. It lost about $600,000 before tax, mainly thanks to higher marketing costs. Now, the shares have been trading almost 20% down. Trade between China and North Korea dropped to its lowest level since February last month. Imports sank as Beijing upheld tough new UN sanctions against Kim Jong-un's regime. The latest UN penalties came into force in September, banning Pyongyang from selling a wide range of products abroad, including coal and seafood. And police in southern China have arrested seven people for their suspected involvement in running an underground bank that was worth more than $3 billion. Now, state media says 10,000 people across the country were involved. The government is trying to shut down illegal operations which aim to help people take money out of the country. Let's take a look now at how the markets have been getting on so far today. And uh, earlier we had a bit of a wobble on the foot, so you can see now it's recovered slightly, but we had a, a slump in Asia overnight where Chinese stocks fell by 3%. And of course the US markets are closed today for Thanksgiving. Now across the rest of Europe, we can see the DAX there, not a lot of trade, pretty flat. We did have strong PMI figures out in the Eurozone, but the DAX subdued over ongoing political uncertainty. In Australia, the All Ordinaries, it's up 0.4 of a percent. And what about the oil price? It has eased back from a two-year high, which we saw earlier in the week, is now fallen to $63.20 at a barrel. Investors worried about oversupply. Let's get rid of the cube. And uh, now we're going to talk about Switzerland. Uh, because one of the most fiercely discussed issues in Europe is the UK's trade link with the European Union after Brexit. That's why a lot of attention was being paid to today's meeting between Switzerland, which isn't in the EU, and the President of the European Commission. Their $400 billion trade relationship is at stake. Well, joining me to discuss this is Geoffrey Yu, head of the UK investment office at Switzerland's UBS Wealth Management. Geoffrey, to start, just remind us, what is Switzerland's current relationship with the EU? So Switzerland's relationship with the EU is actually governed by a whole array of um, bilateral um, treaties, you know, negotiated uh, over the past decades or so. And, uh, you know, some are, you know, have more permanence than others. And uh, some of the topics in question right now, such as the, uh, the uh, cohesion fund, you know, for example, um, the original, you know, payments to the original agreements um, to the uh, A10 um, countries, which joined the EU um, in 2003, that expired last summer so this is one of the sticking points and also the wider trading relationship uh, immigration for example how that's to develop because these uh, meetings these negotiations have been going on since mm. this referendum Switzerland had in mm. 2014 about immigration about mm. wanting to have a bit more control over movement across their borders mm. uh, were you expecting any sort of outcome or resolution today um, so um, the referendum itself um, you know, did um, surprise uh, observers of course um, as the year has been saying if you want single market access um, before freedoms are sacrosanct right so controls on immigration and that's a sticking point switzerland has implemented some loose restrictions so that actually is less controversial again the other areas you know involved you know payments and also jurisdiction you know, ecj how that governs bilateral relationship for example you know these things still need to be resolved yeah. are you seeing any parallels here yeah. with brexit because some commentators are saying oh, how this gets resolved yeah. if it gets resolved in time could be yeah. a blueprint for brexit that's uh, well, sort of you know out of the eu but mm -hmm. good trade relationship mm -hmm. well let's be very clear here this is about switzerland Switzerland and the EU is about country already with an existing bilateral relationship with the EU, how they want to refine this relationship further. The UK is leaving the European Union. So, you know, these are completely two separate um, styles of negotiation. And I think both countries, both Switzerland and the UK, will be saying they are not comparable. And um, I believe, you know, that's probably the best way to look at it. Right. Uh, now, the cohesion fund, mm. that's what really we were looking for mm. a resolution on today. Mm. Mm. Uh, what do you expect is going to happen with that? Switzerland are expected mm. to contribute another mm. 1 billion francs, which mm. is about 1 billion US dollars. Well, you know, Overall, you know, these contributions and will be, will be expected to continue. And this was agreed in a referendum, you know, over a decade ago with respect to the A10 nations. They are still paying, you know, to um, nations of joining after um, the, the A10 nations as well. So Bulgaria, Romania, for example. So this is going to continue. And the bottom line is, you know, these payments are necessary, you know, to continue the strong bilateral relationship. And it's something that Switzerland seeks to continue, access to the single market. Okay, Jeffrey, you head of the UK Investment Office at UBS Wealth Management. Thank you Thank for you. your time.
Now we've got a minute to take a quick look at what is trending online in the business world. And as you probably know, it's Thanksgiving and that means one thing to most Americans, turkey for tea. Bloomberg notes that this year there'll be enough for second helpings as a supply glut, glut means the birds are cheaper this year. Also trending online, a New York Times article about one of the lesser reported impacts of Brexit. They say more European doctors and nurses have been leaving the UK since the Brexit vote and the numbers coming from the EU to replace them are falling. That will hit the staff strapped NHS. And is Vladimir Putin secretly one of the richest men in the world? A reporter at Business Insider has spent four years in Russia looking into his wealth. Okay, now here's a real treat for you. Coming up, would you pay more than half a million dollars for a balloon? I don't think this one costs half a million. Uh, these are no ordinary inflatables. It's the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York, and we'll be finding out why companies reckon balloons like these are worth it. Britain is leaving the European Union. Talks are underway, but what will Brexit mean for the rest of the world? In Asia, companies that have invested in the UK are wondering whether they have to rethink their strategy and move their money and their factories elsewhere. Who will benefit? Europe's governments are lobbying hard to win their business. African exporters also sense an opportunity as the UK tours the world looking for new trading partners. President Trump has already said he'd strike a quick deal with Britain, but hasn't said what he wants in return. India sees more advantage in taking its time. A good agreement on trade, it says, is better than a rushed one. But does it risk on missing out? Brexit will bring change around the world, but here in the UK, the debate goes on. Will leaving the EU prove a smart business move? Business on the BBC. Make the connection. You're watching Talking Business with me, Rachel Horn. Our top story, a division of Mitsubishi Corporation has become the latest Japanese company to get caught up in a scandal about fake data over its products. They were used in cars and planes, but no safety concerns have yet been reported. Now, Brazil is one of the world's biggest markets for ride-hailing apps. Uber is the biggest, and the whole industry is facing the prospect of greater regulation. But one company is trying to stand out by only taking female passengers. I didn't report because when you do that, company will study this case, and between this time, you are blocked. I needed to work, so I decided don't report because was uh, I considered minimal damage, just a kiss. É, nós nascemos com 1.100 motoristas, mas agora nós já temos 11.000 mulheres né, motoristas cadastradas. E nesses oito meses, né, nesse tempo, nós tivemos mais de 150 mil downloads de passageiras. Não é fácil criar uma empresa né, é, de um ramo totalmente masculino, dois ramos, né, que é tecnologia e transporte. É, os desafios são enormes, porque às vezes você tem que enfrentar né, algumas situações até de machismo mesmo. Algumas pessoas não acreditam que mulheres são boas no volante. 93% dos acidentes que acontecem com morte no trânsito são causados por homens. Now, Thanksgiving is one of the highlights of the calendar in the United States. And if you live in New York, it means a chance to see the annual Macy's Parade, which involves extravagant, giant inflatables being paraded through the streets of the city. But each one costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to put together. So are they really worth it? Well, Adam Faulkner is Managing Director of Balloon, an inflatable and aerial marketing company. Adam, thank you very much uh, for coming into the studio. Now, these Macy's inflatables, we're talking serious amounts of money, almost $200,000 to build them, more than half a million dollars simply to fill them with the helium. Why are companies prepared to pay so much? Um, inflatables are conjure up something very childish in everybody's imagination. They are 
interactive in a social world where everything is behind a screen. There's something that's big and larger than life that's right in front of you. And so people love to see them. They love to post about them and it, it captures people's imaginations. But really in terms of marketing and advertising, would the company not be better off spending hundreds of thousands of dollars somewhere else rather than on one inflatable for one parade? It's the longevity of what you get going on afterwards. Um, as I said, we're a social world. Um, those pictures that people take get shared to their family and friends, then then get shared wider. Uh, Macy's Parade is broadcast all over the world. Um, what other opportunity do you have to get your brand or your character in front of that kind of audience for that amount of money? Okay, now the Macy's uh, Parade is at one extreme. You yeah. know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for an inflatable. But actually, in terms of day-to-day -day company using these inflatables as some sort of advertising or promotion, you've brought um, a duck into the studio, uh, yeah. which hopefully we'll be able to see in a moment. Now, that's a lot smaller than the Macy's inflatables. He is, yeah. But this, this duck here, how much would that cost? And, and what sort of promotion would a company use that for? Um, well, that's the um, Stoke-on-Trent City of Culture duck, um, which was their mascot. And something like that costs, can cost as little as two, three hundred pounds. So as a value for money, um, it carried a hashtag and the idea was that people shared that around, once again, social media and obviously newspapers and traditional media. And so it, it once again, represents fantastic value for money for people. Now I think we can see some of the Macy's parade yeah. pictures. Um, we should be able to see them with those massive um, inflatables that we were discussing. I mean, it takes something like between 70 and 90 volunteers to handle each one. Yeah. Um, but I guess, like you were suggesting, it's the fact that this parade is uh, broadcast right around the world. And in the days of social media, actually, rather than spending money advertising on social media, uh, people are taking pictures of these inflatables and posting that on their social media, aren't they? Yeah, it's the ideal opportunity for brands um, to create content that people want to share and people want to interact with. Um, inflatables aren't just as a prop, you know, you have play inflatables, bouncy castles, obstacle courses, all sorts of things that, you know, can be filled with air. Oh, there's, there's Pikachu. Yeah. Pokemon inflatable there. Uh, you know, that sort of thing, what sort of coverage, why would the company advertise that? Everybody knows Pokemon anyway. Do they just want them there to be part of that positive feeling of a Thanksgiving Day parade? Yeah, it is. It's a real positive feeling to have your balloon, to have your character as part of something so big, a global phenomenon that is something such as Macy's Parade. Okay, Adam Faulkner, Managing Director of Bloon, Inflatable and Aerial Marketing Company. Uh, that's it from the programme. Obviously, we're not going to bring you the American markets because the American markets are shut today. All the traders are there downtown in New York watching that parade. But don't forget, you can get in touch with me and some of the team on Twitter. I'm at BBC Rachel Horn. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Rolex is proud to celebrate the art of cinema and recognize those who create the extraordinary. We're on our way to visit a film in production here in Goa. The dialogue will all be in the local language of Konkani. What's impressive about the Indian film industry is the strength of its regional filmmaking. Films are made in more than 20 languages, emanating from different parts of the country. Okay. Hello, ready? This is the set of Oh La La, a Konkani film being shot over the course of 21 days. Production budget, $160,000, high by local standards. It's a comedy, but with at least one character wearing blackface, it's not exactly enlightened entertainment. One of the film's leading men believes this Konkani film, like much of regional cinema in India, will resonate because of language. Every state has their own flavor, and they would like to preserve it. And Goans like to preserve this uh, like a speaking of Konkani and they would like to promote uh, Konkani films. Some regional cinema is huge, eclipsing the traditional heart of Indian filmmaking, that is Bollywood films made in Hindi in Mumbai. 
In fact, the biggest hit at the Indian box office this year wasn't a Bollywood film, but a Telugu picture made in southern India called Bahu Bali 2, The Conclusion, an epic fantasy action movie. The success of Bahubali is a massive victory for Telugu cinema. Uh, it, it really broke out. We talk about the one film that breaks out. We talk about Indian films that break out in the worldwide market. But here was a Telugu film that broke out. Um, you know, traditionally, there's always been a bit of a snotty attitude towards regional cinema as far as Bollywood's concerned. Bollywood's always behaved like, we're the big guys. We've got the big stars. We do the big business. We make the pan-Indian films. We make the films that, that work across uh, the country. But this Telugu film...